Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming uh, here to Frankfurt uh, for our talk, which is uh, called La Vignette History and Memory. We will talk about La Vignette, but we will take also a wider view of the Ukrainian Jewish relationship today. Uh, my name is Natalia Fedushchek. I'm Director of Communications at Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, a Canadian charitable nonprofit organization. And I'm pleased to be joined by Vladislav Davidson. Davidson, who I call him often that way, Vladislav, um, is the European Culture Correspondent at Tablet. He's a fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center and the author from Odessa with Love, Political and Literary Essays in Post-Soviet Ukraine. He was the founder and chief editor of the Odessa Review, who we just learned it had a short break, but we'll be coming back um, on Substack. Um, he's a contributor to Foreign Policy Magazine and the Opinion Section of the Wall Street Journal. He studied human rights law in Venice. And his newest book is Jewish Ukrainian Relations and the Birth of a Political Nation, Selected Writings 2013 to 2023. Uh, I would like to say a few words about UJE. Um, we are, were founded in 2008. And it is a privately organized multinational initiative uh, that was founded as a collaborative project involving Ukrainians of Jewish and Christian heritage, Jews and others uh, in Ukraine, Israel, and the diasporas. Our work engages scholars, civic leaders, artists, governments, and the broader public in an effort to strengthen mutual comprehension and solidarity between Ukrainians and Jews. So the two books that we will be looking at are Babinyan History and Memory and, and Vladislav's newest book. Um, uh, the sort of the genesis of the Babinyan book, History and Memory, uh, is from uh, the 75th year commemoration of the tragedy of Babinyan. In that year, in 2016, UJP, working in cooperation with the World Jewish Congress, uh, the Ukrainian government and other Ukrainian Jewish and diaspora organizations sponsored a series of public events to commemorate the 75th year anniversary of the murder of nearly 34,000 Jews that occurred at Babinyan. Babinyan is a ravine on the outskirts of Kiev, the Ukrainian capital. Like Auschwitz in Poland, Babinyan in Ukraine has become a major symbol of the destruction of Europe's Jews during the Holocaust. In 2016, the events included a youth conference, a public symposium, a memorial space competition, and a commemorative concert. And presented at the symposium was a new book on Babinyar that was published both in Ukrainian and in English uh, by the Ukrainian publisher Ukhen uh, This was a collective monograph by a distinguished group of Ukrainian and international scholars investigating Babinyar in all its aspects. And then beyond the detailed and harrowing accounts of what actually took place in Kiev in late September 1941, the book covered Babinyan, this historic uh, symbol, before and after the Holocaust. So the book that we have here today is an updated version of the English language book that appeared first in 2016. It is co-edited by Paul Robert Magici, who is the chair of Ukrainian studies at the University of Toronto and a board member of UJE and Dr. Vladislav Hinevich, a senior research fellow at the Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine in Kiev. Um, a, a few words about the book. Uh, the first of the book's three parts provides an overview of the geographical space of the ravine and the historical conditions in Europe and Ukraine leading up to World War II. The second part details the mechanism by which Nazi Germany carried out the murder of nearly 34,000 Jews in just two days, September 29th, 30th, 1941, and the ongoing killing of Jews and non-Jews in Babinyar during the remaining years of the war. The third part looks at Babinyar after Babinyar, how the symbol of the Holocaust by bullets was remembered by survivors, how it has been depicted in literary works, art, cinema, music, and how for nearly 80 years since the 1941 tragedy, it has been remembered through a variated, variegated array of commemorative events and monuments. Included in Babinya history and memory are over 100 illustrations, which are mostly in color, and two unique maps depicting the streets and the road to death that led to the killing sites in the Babinya ravine. 
and the book can be ordered through the University of Toronto Press. Um, today, you know, as Ukraine fights for its very existence, Babinyar still remains very much part of Ukrainian collective memory. And these essays give us an understanding a wide view of Babinyar, how it was, how it is, and of course the atrocities that took place there. Um, I encourage everybody to, uh, we have a flyer in our stand that you has the ordering information, and um, uh, I think now we will have uh, a conversation with uh, Vladislav about his new book, which also helps us put Babinyan past and present, and perhaps the future into um, perspective. So, Vladislav, why this book, and why now? Hi, thank you so much, Natalka. Thank you to uh, our friends at Eva Divinlog and to the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, to the CEO, Mr. Christian, who is here, uh, very kindly attended our talk early in the morning at the, at the, uh, the Buchmess, Frankfurt, 75th. Uh, this, this book is a coalition, but also a, a, you know, kind of configuration of my work of 10 years. It's my second book of essays on Ukraine. It is a book on the, the, the memory politics that, I, that I've been working on and concerned with for many years. It is a book of, uh, you know, love for the country and for the people and for the nation. It's a book of, of, of deep care. It's a book that I, I, uh, I'm very proud to, to have worked on because these are things that I, that I deeply care about. And this book, to me, traces the 10 years since the, since the Maidan revolution, will be next, it'll be already a decade next year, during which time Ukraine became a contemporary state, like an independent state, right? The first 14 years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the various republics went in their own way. Some of them became what they should have been or what they wanted to be. Others put off that transition for a long time for various reasons, right? Uh, Belarus and Ukraine are both in that category. These are countries that put off the transition, their post-Soviet transition, for a decade or more. The Ukrainians in 1992 hoisted up the flag of uh, the Ukrainian independent nation, but it was basically still the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine in many ways, right? It was still captured by uh, the old mentalities, it was captured by oligarchs, it was captured by um, old institutional arrangements, old, uh, old ideologies. It wasn't yet an independent country. It certainly wasn't independent of Russia, it wasn't independent of corruption, it wasn't independent of its own trauma, and it wasn't independent of the past, right? So, 2014, 2013, 2014, the Maidan Revolution, those three months, it was a, a, a kind of political birth, right? But it takes years to grow up after you're born. It took about 10 years for Ukraine to become an independent state with all the things that make it independent, culturally, politically, institutionally, socially, right? So it took, uh, it took five to seven years to create all the cultural institutions that make up uh, the environment of a, uh, of, of a cultural architecture, like the, the distribution companies that sell the films, the uh, publishing firms, the translation firms that make books, the, the uh, writer's residencies, all those things that make up the ecosystem of a country's culture. It took five to 10 years to, to make those things. So what this book is about is, uh, is the way that uh, Jews, or historically the or other, like the, 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 the eternal insider-outsider, who always been part of Ukraine, played a role in the construction of a state, in the construction of a new country, in the construction of a new nation, in the construction of a new way of being in Eastern Europe uh, between Ukrainians and Jews, right? I think this book charts the way that Ukraine is different from Russia, that like Russia, Ukraine is full of all sorts of different people, and they live together in 
a, a, a very tolerant and useful social arrangement. Right? They, they live together without killing each other, they live together fairly well. Right? Whereas in Russia, all the different people that live together in Russia make up the, 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 the Russian state. They are held together by force. Right? They're held together by autocratic force. Whereas in Ukraine, people live together in a, net, in a generative and generous and liberal fashion together, in a democratic fashion. And so the thesis of this book right, is that to understand the way that the Ukrainian political nation has formed over the last 10 years, you have to understand the way that Ukraine has dealt with and lived with its Jewish minority. But you make an, inter you make an interesting point here, that you write that the central thesis of this book is that understanding the story of Ukrainian Jewry over the last decade since the Maidan Revolution is central to understanding the development of Ukraine as a modern nation state. How is that so? Because you would have a lot of Ukrainians who might take issue with that statement. So a modern, a modern liberal nation state or a democratic nation state has a particular kind of relationship to its minorities, right? Especially uh, in, in Eastern Europe where we all know the history of what happened there, right? Uh, Jews and Ukrainians, uh, as I write in the book in other places, were stateless people who were caught up in other people's imperial projects, right? They were two nations that uh, for lack of a for lack for lack of a more comely way to put it, they're always caught between a Russian and a German and, and a Turkish political project, right? They're always part of someone's Russian speaking, German speaking, uh, or uh, uh, Turkish speaking imperial project, and so they were both stateless people in that sense. They were big. They had a they had a sense of themselves, both the Ukrainians and the Jews, but they didn't have their own country from for many hundreds of years, right? And so they were they were formed as, as nationalities within other people's imperial uh, imperial fantasias. And that has a kind of deforming quality. It's not good, it's never good for uh, a, a people to, to not rule themselves. Uh, there are certain pathologies that creep in, that's not good, right? There are problems that come up with that. And the Ukrainians, uh, to their great credit, unlike other countries which achieve independence, uh, we could look at the history of national political movements all over the world. I'm not gonna, we're not going to name names, but uh, historically, when a multinational empire collapses and a ethno-state forms, that's bad for minorities. That's bad for for living together. Yugoslavia, you look at, uh, you look at uh, the Ottoman Empire, you look at the, the former uh, Russian Empire, which turned to the Soviet Union. When a empire like that collapses, often that leads to bloodshed. That did not happen in the Ukrainian case for very important spiritual, metaphysical, historical, political reasons. And the fact that it did not happen paved the way, I believe, for Ukraine to become a democratic state in a way that other post-Soviet nations did not. That transition to a liberal democratic polity, yeah, I mean, Ukraine obviously has a lot of problems, so let's not kid ourselves, it has a lot of problems. A lot of those problems uh, are uh, pathological outcomes of Russian capture of the state, right? For, for many hundreds of years. The first 15, 20 years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire, uh, by other means, right? But the fact that the Ukrainians were able to transition to a very generative way of living with different kinds of people in Ukraine, Poles, Muslims, Greeks, uh, my own home region of Odessa, uh, Bulgarians, Romanians, Gagauz, all sorts of people live together in Ukraine. Uh, I believe that understanding the Jewish relationship to Ukrainians within the last 10 years is the key to understanding uh, 
the construction of a civic national political project? I think it's very important. So the book, I mean, the, the essays run from 2013 to 2023. Um, you were in Ukraine before 2013, I believe. And I'm curious how um, how do you see the Ukrainian Jewish relationship? How has it changed within the time frame that you address within this book and even earlier? Do you see tendencies within that time frame and how the dialogue has been between Ukrainians and Jews? Yeah, absolutely. A lot has happened, obviously, since 2013. Mainly, I think, the fact that the younger generation of, of, uh, of, of young Ukrainians became very patriotic in a very healthy sense, right? And, you know, the flag, the symbols of the state, I mean, the people who were, the people who were waving them very vigorously 15, 20 years ago, they were obviously, to one extent or another, ethno-nationalists. So they were, they were, you know, where, where I come from, where my wife comes from, in south of Odessa, wasn't particularly patriotic part of the country, right? That's changed a lot. The, the, the symbols of the state are now everybody's symbols. The, the, the Ukrainian flag is the flag of everybody in Ukraine. It's not just the flag of someone very, very patriotic. Uh, who speaks Ukrainian at home and uh, comes from Lviv or Poltava or wherever, uh, or the West, or Chernowitz. It is now the flag of all Ukrainian minorities and all Ukrainian citizens. I think that's very important, the, the, the relationship of, of um, the young to the state, which is, which is a comparatively new thing. That's one thing. Secondly, the kind of bisecting of the wider Jewish post-Soviet world within Eastern Europe, where Ukrainian Jews started thinking of themselves as more as Ukrainian, and as more, and, and more than they used to as post-Soviet people, that's important. I think that the, uh, the I think that the, the number of very important people in Ukrainian culture who contributed to the culture publicly, raised the awareness of the rest of the country to the importance of uh, the Jewish community within the country, certainly within the politics, within the culture, within the business. Uh, thirdly, I believe that the, how do I put this delicately, the number of young Jewish activists who were involved in the Maidan and the number of young men who came back from Israel with IDF training and went to fight in the East in 2014 and or at least taught people on the Maidan military skills that they learned as young men. I think that created about five to ten years of tremendous generosity and graciousness from the rest of the population. I think the, the representation of, of, of the community in the Maidan, it created trust. It created a, a set of relationships that, that were well understood. The other thing that happened is that obviously Ukraine, which was never a particularly militaristic society, never a particularly militaristic society, didn't really have an army for obvious reasons after the war, after the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, had to become over the last nine, ten years, and certainly over the last 19 months, a really martial, martial society. A society that has had to privilege new values. Values of self-defense, self-reliance, resilience, the kinds of values that are, uh, that, that still divide Eastern Europe from Western Europe, and uh, like the pre-post-historical world from the historical world. And, Ukrainians, even from 2014-15 on, began to understand that their security architecture and their way of being in the region would look more and more like Israel's relationship with its neighbors. 
And I think a lot of people, even ordinary people, understood that very clearly. That, that became something that, that, that Poroshenko talked about, President Poroshenko talked about after about 2017-18. That is something that President Zelensky talks about. I think we should get back to him in a second. But the, the, uh, the security and social arrangement of the country very much began to mimic Israel's relationship to its neighbors, which is, of course, a complex one. So that, in this sense, we're talking about Ukraine internally. Yes. But then there's the external question of how do uh, Jews from Ukraine or who have ancestors, whose ancestry is from Ukraine, how they see themselves. I mean, this summer in June, I was in Israel, um, in Jerusalem, and walking out the door was a young man who had a trident tattooed behind his ear, and he was wearing a Star of David earring, which started an interesting discussion with him, and he apologized that he didn't speak Ukrainian, uh, that he was raised in a Russian language atmosphere. His first language was Russian, but his parents were from Kiev. He says his father is a strident Ukrainian nationalist, and his mother sees Ukraine as a place of, of death for Jews. And he's struggling with his identity. Um, he was one of these people who, when the war broke out, he, a DJ from LA, he had one of these, you know, uh, at a disco, raised a lot of money and sent it uh, to help Ukraine. But he says, I struggle with my identity. I am not quite sure who I am. And I mean, how do you, I mean, how as, let's say, how do we reach out to young people as a diaspora and help them down this road? And if we talk about Zelensky, I mean, how much of an effect do you think it has had that President Zelensky being Jewish sort of has raised the awareness of Jews in the diaspora about their own identity or at least beginning to question their own identity? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. First of all, the fact that Zelensky was president of Ukraine, uh, I believe it saved the country. I believe it, I believe it uh, uh, you know, come of the hour, come of the man. I mean, I had dinner with him once, in two, right before he became president, and I was like, okay, he's you know, charismatic TV star populist. I, how do I, I didn't know that I was having dinner with Churchill. It was a world historical moment that you know, I could tell my grandkids that I had dinner with Zelensky right before he became president. Uh, you know, come, again, come of the hour, come of the man. The fact that he is young, 42, 43, represents the new generation. The first, the first post, truly post-Soviet president of Ukraine, in the sense that he was a, he was a, a kid in the 80s. He's not like, unlike Poroshenko, who's a decade older than him, he's not a Soviet person, he's not homo Sovieticus. he's post homo Sovieticus. He comes out of the, uh, of the 90s, he's a young man in the 1990s. He's formed by the 1990s, not by the 1970s or 1980s. He is uh, very much like the country in that he's, when he comes to power, he's not particularly ideological. He comes to power not thinking very much about these things, and he just, you know, he's just a Russian-speaking guy from the southeast. He is the representative in many sociological ways of much of the country. Partly why he was elected. Of course, he got three quarters of the vote for a reason. Uh, the fact that he was president, his own, his own tremendous charisma and prowess aside, he binds together the population because he's a minority, and he has a he has a government of minorities. I mean, he just switched up his defense minister, who was a uh, a, a, a Jewish guy from Lviv for a Crimean Muslim Tatar from, from uh, Uzbekistan, like myself born in Uzbekistan as a new defense minister, uh, which is amazing, right? You're like, this wartime cabinet, you have, a, you have a Ukrainian gentleman of Jewish descent as the president, and trades in this Jewish defense minister for his Crimean Tatar Muslim defense minister, right? Which is kind of amazing, right? Uh, Zelensky's, Zelensky doesn't really need to do anything. He is himself, and he represents his, his roots and his sociological position of the society. 
and it also disarmed all the criticism about Nazis and all this psychotic nonsense that was coming out of Moscow. So I, I, I strongly believe the fact that we had a Ukrainian gentleman of Jewish descent as the president, it, it allowed to uh, consolidate the nation in the beginning of the war, right? And what about those people who are living up there? Thank you. So uh, I've been involved in those conversations and I'm talking to people and writing pieces and uh, writing op-eds. The, the war has completely mixed up relations in the diaspora, all the diasporas, in Canada, in America, in Israel, in Germany, in, in the UK. Lots of people in the, in the, in the Jewish diaspora, the Ukrainian Jewish diaspora, which I come out of and I grew up in, in New York, were not sure what to do with this war. And it made them more happy to be part of the Ukrainian political nation. Lots of people in my own family, half my family have Russian passports, right? And half my relatives have Russian passports. And a lot of the people that I grew up with are, are Jews from, from the Soviet Union. Often, they, often they're from Babrus or, like, or, or, or Moldova, but they think of themselves as Russian Jews. You, you, you meet very often, and I know lots of people, who were born in uh, Babrus or, or uh, Berdichev or, or Moldova or, or Belarus or, or Azerbaijan, or like myself. Uh, I was born in Uzbekistan. They think of themselves as quote unquote Russian Jews. They stop calling themselves that and they say, well, well, because no one really wants to be, you know, connected to a genocide. This is not cool. No one wants that as their identity. And people are starting to rethink their identity 30 years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. What does it really mean to be a post Soviet person when you haven't lived in Moscow or Moldova or Belarus for 28 years or 30 years or when you came to America as a four year old and you're completely American or completely Canadian or completely German? You still want some connection to your uh, ancestral roots and to the diaspora because you still hang out with Russian speakers. But like being a quote unquote Russian Jew isn't cool anymore, right? So it's a really reshaped relations in my diaspora. In your diaspora, which is the Ukrainian diaspora, like the ethnic Ukrainian diaspora, I think it gave a lot of different people new perspectives on, on people they probably didn't always even know existed, right? The, the two diasporas, the, the, the Russian-speaking diaspora and, uh, and, and the Russophone diaspora, even the Jewish-Ukrainian Russophone diaspora, which I grew up in, in the UK, in, in the US, didn't always have interactions with the Ukrainians. Right. Yeah. That's true. And a, a lot of those conversations within the diaspora are quite new, and they only started in many ways after the Maidan, after 2014, and they intensified uh, two years ago, uh, uh, as the war was was gearing up, so uh, you have to you have to look at what's happening within, internally within the Jewish diasporas everywhere, internally within the Ukrainian ethnic diaspora, especially in Canada, and what is happening uh, in places like Israel where they have their own thing, right? Right. Um, which I guess brings us in a way back to this question of Babinyad in the sense of memorialization. Um, because there is you know, a big question, how do we memorialize Babinyad? We're not gonna get into that discussion here. Um, but about a third of your book, or a quarter of the book deals with the question of Babinyad. I wanted to read from the preface of the book Babinyad, History and Memory, uh, Norman Neymar wrote in the preface um, he says, uh, even as it represents one of the most important historical and symbolic events in the history of the Holocaust, indeed in the history of genocide, Babinyan is in many ways still unfinished business. There is no consensus on how to memorialize the el elimination of the Cayman Jews that took place there. There is no agreement on how to represent the collaboration of Ukrainian police auxiliaries and the mass murder of the Jews. There is also considerable confusion about how to deal with the multiple interests of victim groups, in addition to the Jews who lost substantial numbers of their people of Babinyad in the years before liberation from the Nazis. One thing is certain, Babinyad will be remembered in Ukraine. Um, and 
He continues, in the wake of Ukrainian independence in 1991, the Orange Revolution of 2004, and the Euromaidan demonstrations of the winter of 2013-14, Ukrainians and Jews have linked arms to honor those who perished at the hands of the Nazis during the war. Babin Yav unites their common grief and inspires common hopes for amity, justice, and truth. Um, so, I'm, based on sort of this, and your current understanding and your current writing of Babin Yav, how do you see memory, um, both within the Ukrainian and the Jewish, and the Jewish experience vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine? And how do you treat that today? So, yeah. Um, in my book, a lot of the essays are, are about the present and about contemporary relations with, with Russia, and propaganda, uh, and Mo Moscow's obsession with World War II, who really lives in World War II. He's, a, he's in many ways a child of the war, he's born immediately after the war. Uh, structurally, in his head, he thinks about a lot of his political issues having to do with the war, right? He's very much a Soviet person, and he thinks about the war and the trauma through the lens of Soviet memory politics and Soviet narratives, Soviet frames, right? The Ukrainians obviously are fighting the past. They're fighting to get out of those Soviet narratives, to get out of the Soviet Union, to break the linkage to trauma of the past. So, you know, on the one hand, you have to do the work, as, as they say now, as the kids say now, of dealing with the trauma of the past, uh, uh, becoming a, a contemporary Ukrainian political state. On the other hand, you have to be very careful about um, engaging in, in, in historical arguments, which can be used politically, one way or the other, which are being used politically against you, by a nation state that wants you to not exist and wants to commit genocide against you and your culture, that literally wants to kill and rape and destroy everything that you've built, right? So it's it's inherently a very political question, right? I, without going too much into into the politics of the Babinar Memorial, which I write about a lot in this book, if you're interested in that, there's a lot in this book about that. Uh, I write a, a long essay on uh, Sergei Lesnitz's film, Bobby Nyar Context, which is a very good film. He's a remarkable filmmaker. I write a lot about the controversies having to do with uh, the Bobby Nyar Memorial Center, but going too much into them, if you're interested in that, uh, that that's there. Uh, Bobby Nyar is the focal point for Eastern European Jews to understand what happened, and it is the it is the mimetic point of the Holocaust by bullets. To understand what happened to uh, Eastern European Jewry, you have to understand what happened at Babinyar, what happened in Kiev. To understand what happened in Germany uh, or in, in Poland, you have to understand concentration camps. To understand what happened in Eastern Europe, you have to understand the Holocaust by bullets completely different form of, uh, of the Holocaust. And what happened in Kiev happened in numerous other places, from Moldova to Transnistria, to up, up to Belarus, up to the Lithuanian border, but the commemoration of those events will take place and has taken place in, in Babinyar, and Babinyar is the, is the toponym, the location, the place that is most closely associated in the popular imagination and the scholarly imagination in the West with the Holocaust against Soviet Jewry, right? So there's no going away from that. There's no getting away from that. Uh, in other ways, you know, all of Ukraine now is a Babinyar. All of Ukraine is a, uh, a, a killing field now, right? In some ways, Babinyar uh, is representative of what has happened, because it's happened everywhere in Ukraine, and we, we can memorize it in that way. But at the same time, we, we can't lose sight of a particularity of what happened, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's unique and it's very particular. I hope that's a good answer. Um, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, and so I am curious, you, I mean, 
Ukraine is at war, Israel is at war. Yep. Um, and I'm wondering how you see now the development of Ukrainian Jewish, Ukrainian Israeli relations developing at this very critical juncture, actually for everybody. Um, how, you know, because, uh, you know, if we listen to, to what President Biden says and what other Ukrainians have said, that both of these wars are actually, they're part of one larger war. How, how does the Ukrainian-Jewish relationship um, develop within this very complex period of time for everyone? Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable time. In my book, I write about the first meeting between Zelensky and Netanyahu right after Zelensky came to power. That was a really interesting moment when uh, Netanyahu came to to uh, to Kiev to campaign. Basically, it was a campaign stop in one of the endless Ukrainian uh, Israeli elections. But it was it was really interesting. I mean, you have the two presidents of, of the time of the two states with Jewish uh, heads of state meeting in uh, uh, well, the prime minister and the, and the president of, of Ukraine meeting together in Kiev. At that moment. Things were okay, but the wars changed everything. Obviously, both Israel and Ukraine are at war with the Iranians. There is a common front. I'm not one of these people that makes these civilizational arguments about the uh, uh, about, you know democracy stops here. If we lose this war, we're going to we're going to live in darkness. I will I will leave that uh, kind of rhetoric to the Anne Applebaums of the world, uh, even though she's right. Uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's not my place to, uh, to make those kinds of over-the-top arguments, that kind of rhetoric. We are at war with, with the same country, right? There is an axis of war crescent that runs up from, from Gaza up through Lebanon into Syria and around the, the Caucasus to the Black Sea, right? You do have alliances between the Russians and the Iranians. On the other hand, the Iranians and, and the Shia bloc, right? The Ukrainians and the Israelis are fighting literally the same people. Uh, that should be understood in Washington, D.C. and in Berlin and in Frankfurt by, by intelligent people. Uh, whether we're fighting for the same values, I, I believe that's the case also. Uh, the Ukrainians have spent the last 19 months complaining that the Israelis were not giving them enough weaponry. There are obviously reasons for that. Netanyahu and uh, Putin have a deal of uh, neutrality based on Israel's own very, very, very complex relationship to the war uh, between the Iranians and the, the, the Sunni Israeli bloc, right? Obviously, uh, Putin allowed the, uh, uh, the Israelis to bomb Syria. They powered down the S-400s every time the Israelis asked to bomb something in Syria. And so the, the Israelis did not want to come in and help the Ukrainians overtly with military support. This made a lot of Ukrainians very unhappy. They felt rebuffed and rejected. Even, uh, even yesterday, this week, uh, President Zelensky asked to come to, uh, uh, to uh, Jerusalem to show his fidelity show support. He was told, no, now is not the right time. Obviously, the President of the United States was coming, and obviously it was a very difficult moment, but Putin only called Netanyahu on the 10th day of the war, whereas Zelensky called him on the first day. And Putin didn't bother even in this uh, telephone conversation with Netanyahu to condemn the Hamas attacks, whereas Zelensky promised to come. And Putin was solicited, and Zelensky was, was uh, uh, politely told not to come, not to cause trouble. This makes a lot of people in Ukraine and in the Jewish diaspora very unhappy. I'm one of those people who has been pushing for that relationship to change. I have an article coming out, an essay coming out in Tablet Magazine on Tuesday, uh, something else that I'm working for another magazine I can't talk about yet. But I'm one of those people who has for a very long time wanted the Israelis to do more for Ukraine in this war. It's been very disappointing for us, for those of us who have wanted that. And I really hope that changes. In the meantime, 
uh, I really hope that this war against Hamas does not take away too much attention from the war against Moscow. Uh, in certain instances, people who've evacuated from Ukraine have also been bombed in Israel. There's a lot of commonality, right? And, you know, it's all very sad. I think it's, you know, it's very sad. Sorry. Well, I wanted to thank everyone for coming um, because we know there will be the next panel. I think it does need to be uh, stressed that within Israeli civil society, um, on the numerous trips that I've made to Israel in the last two years, that there's a great deal of support for Ukrainians, and so I um, am hopeful about the future of the relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.